Hey, this is Tim back for Wrong Sports, and if you've checked out my channel before, you know I've been talking a lot about worst football teams, and I've been doing worst college football teams of every decade. I did oldest worst college football teams. That was before World War II. Then I did worst college football teams coming out of World War II. I did worst in the 1970s, but now I'm going to be doing the worst college football teams of the 1980s. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe to the channel, please. Uh, it helps me churn out more videos. And also, in the future, I'm going to be doing some best college football teams lists. I just need to get through the worst ones first. And the 1980s was actually huge for college football because this is where we saw the rise of Miami as they won a couple of national titles, as well as Penn State. Oklahoma was also in there as well, winning national titles. But on this list, I won't be covering Penn State or Miami or Oklahoma because I'm going to be covering the teams that Penn State, Oklahoma, and Miami beat by like 60 points. Just a note on this list, I will not be going over Ivy League teams because they technically were not in Division One in the 1980s. They were now down in the 1AA slot. Uh, so if you're wondering where Columbia is going to fall on this list because they were very bad in the 1980s, they will not be on this list. I will actually be doing another video covering their epic losing streak in the future, so stay tuned for that. Uh, before we get to our top 10 list, I'm going to start with my honorable mentions, and my first honorable mention is a team that will be showing up a couple of times on this list. Unfortunately, though, this team wasn't bad enough to make the top 10. This is the 1989 Northwestern Wildcats. Now, this team I could not put in my top 10 list, even though they were really bad, uh, but they did somehow manage to average 21 points per game, uh, but they did give up 45 points per game, so they really couldn't keep up. Uh, they were in games towards the beginning of their season, but then this team totally fell apart around game six or so because their last four games, they were outscored 237 to 70. But let's get to another honorable mention. This is the 1982 Rice Owls. So if you don't know, Rice was like pretty much an Ivy League team, except they were in the toughest football conference at the time, pretty much. They were in the Southwestern Conference, which had Texas, uh, Arkansas, pretty much all the Texas teams were in there in Arkansas. And unfortunately, Rice was just not that good because they could not recruit uh, the best players in that fertile ground of Texas. So they were mostly uh, playing with a bad hand throughout most of their time in the Southwestern Conference. But coming into 1982, they were actually pretty respectable. They were 4-7, and seven, but unfortunately, the bottom fell out this year uh, because Rice had troubles on offense. They had no rusher having more than 400 yards for the whole season. They had no quarterback pass passing for more than a thousand yards and even though they were not shut out this year they lost every game except for two games by more than two touchdowns their defense however wasn't that bad considering they played three top 10 teams and didn't give up more than 41 points so that's another reason why i didn't want to put them on this list all right, well, let's get to the list and start in the MAC with top 10 and the 1989 Kent State Golden Flashes. So just a spoiler, this won't be the only Kent State team on this list. Uh, they were coming into the season with a 5-6 and six record uh, from the previous season, and they also had a well-known head coach in Dick Crum, who previous to this coached at Miami of Ohio and UNC, and he actually won conference titles with both of those teams. Also, coming into this season, uh, Kent State, they were without a huge piece of their offense in Eric Wilkerson. He was their running back, and he was a huge piece of Dick Crum's offense in 1987 and 1988 because they predominantly ran the ball. And without him, Crum would have to try upwards of five running backs this season due to trying so many running backs and also with none of them really being all that good. All of them averaged less than four yards a carry, and their leading rusher had only 304 yards. So with the offense not scoring... But running a lot and running down the clock, they didn't give up crazy amounts of points uh, because they mostly ran the ball. So they wasted a lot of time as they only gave up 34 points per game. They were, however, within four points in three games, but they did lose to the next worst team in the MAC in Ohio by 23, giving Ohio their only win that season. Kent State and Coach Crum would get some revenge next season as they lost their first six games in 1990 to extend this losing streak to 17, but they eventually won won their seventh game against Ohio. But ending the streak didn't help Crum keep his job at Kent State as he would leave after the 1990 season. 
and I'm going to be headed out west for my number nine team. This is the 1980 Oregon State Beavers, and if you know Oregon State football, you know that they mostly struggled in the 1970s, and to start this decade, it was pretty much more of the same. They started this season with a new coach in Joe Avanzano, who was a longtime assistant in college before taking the job. He came to Corvallis to see a team that won 10 games over the previous four seasons, but this season they returned their star and pretty much most of their offense from the previous season in their running back Tony Robinson. He ran for over 500 yards last season, as well as had a dozen or so receptions. Unfortunately, the quarterback he had last season didn't play much of this season, and when he did, quarterback Scott Richardson didn't play well, as he had zero touchdown passes and seven interceptions. They did have another starting quarterback in Ed Singler, who didn't play as terrible as Richardson, as he had a 101 QB rating, but he could only muster three touchdowns with 10 picks this this year, so really not all that much better. Uh, because of the mediocre QB play, the offense relied heavily on Robinson, who was about 150 yards short of 1,000 yards this year and had another 290 yards in receptions. But his yardage wasn't enough to help this team win or even score a lot, as they only averaged 10 points per game. And 10 points per game might seem better than some of the teams on this list, uh, but their defense didn't help, as they gave up an average of 35 points per game. Oh yeah, and clearly Oregon State wasn't in really any of these games as they lost every single game by 10 points or more, and their closest game was a 19-point loss to Oregon in the Civil War game. The defense didn't give up 70 or even 60 points this season, so really not that bad. Uh, it seemed like every game, though, they played, they were ready to lose. Avanzano with Oregon State didn't get a whole lot better uh, as they could manage a two-win season as their best season under him, uh, but Avanzano would at least land on his feet after his run at Oregon State as he would become a longtime Dallas Cowboys special teams coach for over a decade, and he actually did win a few Super Bowls, so this 1980 season is a distant memory for him. And number eight is a team that you will be seeing on this list because you saw them on my previous lists. This is the 1987 Kansas State Wildcats. Now, we are getting into the trenches with these bad teams because Kansas State is one of those teams that will be appearing on this list twice, and it was tough picking which Kansas State team is worst. Kind of like another list that I have where I had Kansas State twice, and it was kind of tough picking which one was worse. But I have to say this 1987 Kansas State team is the least worst of the two. The reason for this team being a little bit better than the other Kansas State team is because they gave up less points and also they didn't lose every game this year. Yeah, I'll get back to that in just a second, but first, this time of Kansas State football is the Stan Parrish era, which was a huge letdown, as the previous season they went 2-9 and nine with wins over an FCS team in Western Illinois and their in-state rival Kansas, who, like them, were the bottom feeders of the then-called Big 8 Conference. But this year, they started the season with a team to another FCS team, an Austin P by 4, and that was the closest it was going to get for them over their next seven games, and seriously... This team lost by three touchdowns or more, and they lost by 12 to Tulsa, but they also scored in garbage time to make it a game, so they really should have lost that game by three touchdowns. They ended up ending their losing streak at 13 in Week 9, where they tied. Yes, they tied, so they didn't win, but they technically ended the losing streak with this tie as they tied their in-state rival Kansas, who were 1-7 coming into this game, but only because of a one-point win over another FCS team, so really these two teams are on the same level at this point. Kansas State ended up making a game of Iowa State next week as they lost by two before a 41-0 shutout loss to Colorado to end their season 0-10-1. This Kansas State team, they had a bad offense that only had five rushing touchdowns and a quarterback with only 1,300 yards and eight passing touchdowns. And yes, that is bad and actually worse than the other Kansas State team on this list, but at least this team tied a game, so at least that's a plus. We are now up to number seven, and we are checking in with Kent State again. This time, it's the 1982 Kent State Golden Flashes, and this team makes the list because, well, they went winless, and also because they gave a win to a team that had a very long losing streak and a team that you will also be hearing about on this list. And Kent State in 1982, they were coming into the season off of a four-win season with their second-year coach, Ed Shellback. Unfortunately, this season would cost Shellback his job, 
Kent State this year, well, they didn't have a terrible defense as they only gave up an average of 27.5 points per game, but their offense didn't help matters as their leading rusher had under 400 yards and their passing game this year averaged just over 130 yards per game. So their offense could barely muster 10 points per game. Even though their offense didn't help a lot in their games, they stayed in many games due to their defense, but they mostly make this list because they went winless and gave a team that was on a 20 plus game losing streak their first win who you'll be hearing about a little bit later and coming in at number six is a team from a state that normally makes this list new mexico except it isn't a new mexico state football team it's actually the 1987 new mexico lobos football team now if i'm putting a team on this list they have to be really bad because they were worse than their in-state counterpart for once but just barely and we will get back to that game in a moment but this team was really bad because this defense was really really bad this team has the distinction of giving up an average of 40 points per game even though when they started the season the defense wasn't that bad as they gave up an average of just 20 points per game then from the fourth game on this team proceeded to give up no less than 35 points per game and they even had six games of giving up 40 plus points including giving up almost 400 rushing yards to air force as air force scored 73 points in this game the unfortunate thing for this team was that their defense was bad but their offense wasn't really that bad as they only had had two games where they didn't score double digits. They averaged 19 points per game, and they also had a quarterback on this team who threw for over 3,000 yards and a wide receiver who had over 1,000 yards receiving. But the low point for this team and the reason why they are on this list is because they lost to their in-state rival, New Mexico State, 17-14. to This was bad because this was New Mexico State's only win on the season, and this was New Mexico State's first win in their rivalry since 1976. They got two games better than next season, and they even managed to beat New Mexico State. So don't worry, they don't show up on this list again, but this 1987 New Mexico Lobos team was really bad. And we're staying out west, and we're going to be in the top five now. The 1981 Colorado State Rams, and this team is a team who made another one of my worst teams list. And this team made this list because of their putrid defense, and because it ended the run of their coach, who actually helped them get back on their feet. The coach for the Rams this season was Sark Arcelinian, who was the Rams coach for the last nine years, and helped them win nine games in 1977, which was one of their winningest seasons ever. But 40 years later, later, this team was struggling. They would start the 1981 season without their star quarterback, Steve Fairchild, and they would use two quarterbacks this season and two young ones as they used a true freshman and a sophomore. This was significant as the Rams were a passing team, so these young quarterbacks got a lot of throws in this year, but they didn't complete more than half of them this season. Though they did throw for more touchdowns and interceptions, 21-17, to 17, their rushing offense was a non-factor, so it was hard for them to stay in many games. Plus, with an offense struggling, the defense needed to step up, which they didn't do clearly because they gave up 500 points or 40 points per game. And unfortunately, Sark Arslanian would leave after this year. And now number four. So you heard about Kansas State already on this list, but we're going to be going to another Kansas State team. This time it's the 1988 Kansas State team, and they were worse than the 1987 version for a few reasons, and I'll tell you why. First off, they lost all of their games. They didn't tie any of them this year. Next, they lost to Kansas, who they tied last year, and like last year, Kansas was also terrible this year. And this would be Kansas' only win this season. Third, Stan Parrish was still the head coach this year after an 0-10 record the previous year and a 2-19-1 record overall. So Kansas State was worse this season, even though they did score more points as they averaged 15 points per game this year, but they really didn't get any better on offense as their starting quarterback this year, Carl Straw, who I had to mention because of his name, threw one more touchdown than the quarterback last year, but he also threw for 17 interceptions. So even though they scored more, they turned the ball over a hell of a lot more. Along with the troubles on offense, this defense was so bad this year compared to last year, as they gave up 
45 plus points in six games. Also, this team made all of their opponents look so much better on offense as Kansas State opponents routinely scored more than their average. Example being in that Kansas loss, Kansas scored 30 points, which was more than their point total average for the season as Kansas averaged 17 points per game. So they almost doubled it in this Kansas State game. This season finally caused the school to fire Stan Parrish and bring in Bill Snyder, who brought them to greater success, and they will not be on my worst teams of 1990s list. Okay, so now we're getting to the nitty-gritty of this list. We're at number three with the 1989 New Mexico State team. Now, the 1980s were not good to New Mexico State. Now, you heard me mention New Mexico, but New Mexico State was really bad during this decade as they won only 22 games. That's it. With most of them against 1AA teams or beating New Mexico, who were just barely a step above them. But yeah, they were really bad this year. 1989, they were coached by Mike Knoll, who was a defensive assistant at University of Miami during their national title wins, but at New Mexico State, he was really bad, as he won only one conference game in four seasons and won only four games total over the four years while he was there. Okay, first up, their offense. Their quarterback did throw for over 1,700 yards this season, but their rushing offense wasn't all that great, as they only averaged 100 yards barely per game this season. And to go along with these struggles on offense, their defense was not helpful, as they gave up 38 points average per game. And New Mexico started this season with probably their worst way, as they went against a juggernaut in Oklahoma. And guess what? They lost 73 to 3. Next up, they had to play their rival, New Mexico, who were not good, clearly, because you heard about me mention them already on this list, but they were also coming into this game off of a two win season in 1988, and New Mexico wiped the floor with New Mexico State, beating them by 32. And they kept it close in their next few games, but their offense couldn't keep up with the defense as their defense was giving up 45 points weekly by the end of the season. This team would end their season with a four-point loss to Pacific, who ended their season 2-10. and 10. So it just shows how bad their competition was, and they still lost to them. The Aggies would lose some more next season before their losing streak ended in the last game of the 1990 season under a new coach who would bring them to their winning record in the next few years. Okay, and number two should not be a surprise since Northwestern football is often rated as the worst football program from the 1940s through about the 1990s, but in the late 1970s, it started to get really bad for them. The badness started with the end of the John Pond era, as he ended his run at the school with consecutive 1-10 in 10 finishes. With him leaving, Northwestern brought in a young and former Northwestern quarterback in Rick Venturi who would not do any better than the previous coach as he went 1-30-1 over the three seasons he was there and left the cupboard pretty bare for the new coach who would step in in 1981 in Dennis Green. Now, you might know Dennis Green because obviously he had a lot of success with the Minnesota Vikings uh, and with other teams in the NFL and also with college. Uh, but the first season under Green was so bad and it didn't start all that well as they lost their first game in the Big Ten to rival Indiana. Indiana would be second to last in the conference this year, so losing close to Indiana really didn't look all that good by the end. That was their closest game as they routinely lost by two touchdowns or more every single game from then on. Their defense gave up 505 points this season, or 45 points per game. They lost to Big Ten co-champions this year, Ohio State and Iowa, by a combined score of 134 to 6. They struggled on defense and also on offense uh, because their offense only averaged seven and a half points per game. They got shut out five times and four times in the Big Ten with their leading passer only having 1,300 yards and their leading rusher had under 200 yards for the whole season. So yeah, they couldn't run the ball at all. Their losing streak went to 31 games at the end of their season, but Dennis Green and Northwestern would eventually win their fourth game next season, so they ended their streak at 34. But yeah, their losing streak is one of the most epic losing streaks in Division I football. And finally, the badness is over with number one, and we are staying in the Midwest, but we're going to Michigan this time with the 1981 Eastern Michigan Eagles, except at this time they were known as the Hurons, 
but Eastern Michigan in the 1980s was a lower tier team that routinely finished in last or second to last in the MAC. And this year was no different for Eastern Michigan, as they were coming into the season on a eight game losing streak. And that streak would continue into this year. They were coached by fourth year head coach Mike Stock, who won less games every year he was at Eastern, and this year was their worst year. They started the season with a close loss to Akron and another loss to Illinois State, who were a lower division by this point. But then once they started MAC play, it got really bad for them. Their first game against Miami of Ohio was a close six-point loss, but then it got so much worse. And yeah, by worse, I mean so much worse, because they would proceed to lose every game from uh, that first game on by four touchdowns or more. Okay, so this team got blown out in pretty much every single game. Uh, it wasn't because of their running game, though. Their running back was actually pretty good. Their running back, Ricky Calhoun, almost broke the 1K mark this season as he had 971 yards. Their quarterback had 1,300 yards. Their quarterback had only six touchdown passes. And Ricky Calhoun had only four rushing touchdowns. So yeah, they just had trouble getting in the end zone this season. And because they didn't get in the end zone all that much and their average points per game was only eight, you would think they got shut out a lot, but they really only got a shut out once and that might be because they played a lot of backups towards the end of these games because they were down by so much so they managed to score in garbage time this team was often rated as the worst division one football team this year and pretty much of the decade but somehow their coach mike stock who was already four years in coaching in ypsilanti managed to get another year he went 0-3 in 1982 before he was canned and their losing streak got to 27 before they recorded a 9-7 to win win in 1982 over another team on this list the 1982 kent state golden flashes so see i told you i would mention them again but thank you so much for hanging out with me and hearing all about the worst college football teams of the 1980s make sure you give me a like share subscribe to my channel please because it actually does a great benefit to me and to the channel uh, and the more subscribers i get the more videos i'm able to churn out here also make sure you follow me on twitter at sports wronged and i'm going to be coming out with more worst videos soon before i get to my best teams videos that's going to be harder than my worst teams videos but thank you so much for hanging out with me and i will We'll have more content coming up for Wrong Sports.